Said love viewers and subscribers who are going open all in good, open all in great. Now we're there again at tune in for another cutting edge and this one is the latest one my people as of August the 14th 2024 the latest my people and in this one Mutabarga will be endorsing paying tribute to Marcus Garvey a legend a living legend my people and also a whole lot more so definitely stay tuned and check in and before you go you know it's a black power movement drop a like and subscribe share to a friend or a family so they can be a part of the movement uh, good night this is the cutting edge august time so give thanks that you are here and give thanks that you are here with me as you say again, the place is warm. It's about Marcus Garvey. You know, his son is here. His second son. He is 91 year old. Yes. I hear you talk about Marcus Garvey Jr., which is his first son. He used to teach me a Kinson Technical. I him make way start to recognize the power, black power. But this is him son now, Julius Garvey, he's here, and he will be all over the place. He'll be launching a book. Monday, I think it's Monday the book going to get launched at the marketplace, so we hope to be there. So we have two interviews that we're going to deal with and then we're going to play something that for those of you who listen to it regular, here we play them already but we can't play them too much because some people never hear them yet. So we're going to take the first break and come forward. First break. Yes, we're there with you as we well, say. <clears throat> Marcus Garvey in a year again and IRFM is up front as usual, you know, say so last year we was here, last year, them day, in the other night, yeah, we was in Spain, Ratatam Festival. Well, this year we are here again. And you know, say, so oh, it go, early morning thing, the Kabu Mahakiru, and I will be sitting there, and then we'll be playing some music, and you know, we have a, what them call it, <clears throat> A great house where all the activities go on, because the activities is inside and outside. It's going to be a wonderful day. We hope so the ones them near and far, as usual, you know, the place usually cock. The thing we're really vexed about is that a whole heap of one come there to see the stage show, the them come late in the evening. It is very important that you come and take in the speakers and what they have to say and the poets, what they have to say in the great house. Because it's all about Marcus Garvey, it's not just about the artists them where you see every day or hear every day. You know, Marcus Garvey come with an understanding and a knowledge of self. And give him the music is entertainment still and this and that. But it is good when you can listen, listen and understand and learn about that great man, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Yes, so I will follow him. We follow him. We follow Marcus Garvey. Yes. The man who was responsible for shouted out Marcus Garvey voice so loud that it reverberated all over the world through the music. The power of the music, what reggae music can do or should do. Yeah, man. Every album this man do him put a Marcus Garvey or two Marcus Garvey songs on it. And when one's never did really talk about Marcus Garvey, him put Marcus Garvey right on the front burner again. And now people all over black consciousness is spearheaded by the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. When we come forward, we want to talk to one of the artists, them a poet, as a matter of fact, that will be featured this Sunday at the Marcus Garvey Tribute. So, 
We take a break and come forward. Yes, as we have said, it's all about Marcus Garvey, them time of year, yeah? And we hope, say, it kind of sink in to the minds of the people, them, about the importance of understanding what Marcus Garvey was all about. But why yellow of Sister P? Yes, I want to yellow of Sister P because once again, we see few thing is back. Few thing take a little break. And we see Sabria as a youthful sister where we know from baby. She combined with her mother and bring it forward and I must say it was wonderful. Yeah, it was wonderful, man. The Sunday was wonderful. And why you look all the ones who turn out. And all the ones them who say are the first them see Muta Baruka. I will play we are play from about why eleven thirty, twelve o'clock. And we done we remember when we done and I pure African music we play the whole day. And we not play over nothing straight the whole day. So that was a feast in itself and the the ambience of the place, man, was wonderful. Yeah man, it was it was good, it was sweet. And we hope that next year more people will come forward because you know you can't stop doing it because you have to keep doing it. And it takes a little while to build up itself. So it was nice, and I hear say it was much more people this year than last year. So I help Sabri have a while up. Sister P and all the people them. Why you up the sound where we have play? <laughs> why you up the sound where we have play, man? Why you up the man there? I tell you. <laughs> I can't want to talk about them, man. They trust me. Anyway, at this day, I got over there. I never love Marcus Garvey. I don't know where this rice and peace thing come from. <laughs> Baga why you, why you get some leaks in a them song, yeah, man. May I tell you? <laughs> well, after Baga why you, seriously. Man, we used to walk up and down Kingston. Anyway, some things are history and some things are imagination. All right. So we're standing by to have our first interview. A poet bridging named Akinsnaya. Akinsnaya. So we're going to go and do this. Akinsanya. Okay, Akinsanya. Okay. Akinsanya. We want to play this. This was a tribute that a whole heap of ones come together and make a win in a day, in a day 80s, you know. I think in a day 80s, this song was made. Both people for radio and artists. Bless it. Bless the love motor. All right. So, a whole heap of things are going on in your background, though. That's right. I'm going to hear you say, get it on a year and I was good. <laughs> And, uh, I, are you uh, are some electronic insect you have? I don't know. Just like you, motor. Yeah, but my pedo one of them not sound so bad. <laughs> my pedo one of them are make music. <laughs> <laughs> I can't that them are going with it. Anyway, yeah. is the first is the first you ever perform on this? No, I I perform with uh, Uprising Roads about three time already there you now. Oh yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, them, man. Okay. Well, them, them say uprising rules, they never call your name. Yeah, man. Akin Sanya is the first I ever perform as a solo act okay, here. But okay. I perform here in Mualemu Marcos Gossi. So, so they are, you know? so they have a poem span vinyl CD. Yeah, man. I have shown. They don't have them. Yeah, I play and I... They play already? Yeah, man. I intend to chant to the United Tune House of Dub. You see, Ross? Yes, sir. Okay. When you want to have a tune out there, you play the tune of Marcus Garvey, you know, King Rastafari, mm. I love it. 
King Rastafari, I love I. And Chuck tracks about Marcus Garvey healing uh-huh. the honorable man. All right, so what? You're not singing a rap poet. Tell me which one. Uh, I am a creative artist, Mota. I do poetry. Poetry is the foundation, you know? Okay. Poetry is the foundation, but, you know, with the music, we mm. chant it, we sing it, we create it, we produce it. Okay. Yeah, you know, the musician, you know? Okay, uh, so I, the I... I'm a creative practitioner. So the I know they with the band again? Yeah, still... You know, I go up on a sabbatical from 2016, you know? Wow, yeah. a long sabbatical. <laughs> no, it was three years, you know, but you know, it's things set up. Then that's a don't sabbat. I don't sabbat that. That's a lot. Who had this thing at sabbat in the rest of the sabbat in three years, man? <laughs> yeah, it's a sabbatical. It's a musical work still, you know, because yeah, you know, yeah. this sabbat is giving thanks and praise to you and finding mm. yourself, you know? Yeah, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. to improve yourself as that my um, UNIA stands for improvements, no? So you're a member of the UNIA, eh? This UNIA, whether you, you have a member? No, I'm not a membership, but you know, UNIA. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Marcus yeah. Garvey thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yes, I am. So, all right, so tell me something now. Like, you're not a profound with a band then, that's what you say? Yeah, man, I can perform with the band. You know, you have the vocals, you have the guitar, and you have the drummer here, you have Mustafa, a drummer, master, drummer, okay, Mustafa. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. No, Mustafa. man, no, me remember, me remember, man. As you yeah, said, the name, you remember. I only put drummer sit on and... Yeah. Yeah, 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 me remember, man, Mustafa. Yeah, man, I'm all there with the sound of the drums, you know? So we don't... Uh, yeah, keep so really, yeah, it's hard as the drummer, I'm going to because I love to see that. Over a great house there, you know. If I had the drummers, I know the other drummers over there. Drummers are going to do the way of No, no, no. I mean the most, the, the group, Mustafa, where they perform up a few things. Yeah, Mustafa got to perform with um, Kings and Drummers, you know. Oh, the other drummers. Yeah, the name of the other tribute to Marcus Garvey, so they'll be there, you know. Yeah. Other drummers will uh, pass through too, they'll create a vibe, you know. Yeah, all right. Well, Bridget. I know St. Thomas here again, I remember you. <laughs> you wait till we play your tune, them. All right, sir. All yes, right. sir. Bless up yourself, man. Yeah, man. Give thanks, Bridget. Yes, thang. sir. See you Sunday, you know. Mark yes, up, please. Yeah. Right. I see my little friend near me, you know. I see my little friend near me, I saw the interview, you know. Charmian Aital, the woman who plant the most yam. <laughs> The one who plot the most yam them and very straightforward with our poem them, yes. Marcus gave the album that was produced <clears throat> years ago, years ago, and a woolly part is upon it. And I don't know if a woolly part one know. But that album created a vibes in a Jamaica because as I said before, a woolly part ones, artists, give them time and energy for the, for go part of the album there. And it still reverberate up to this day because the variations of Marcus Garvey tribute was so pronounced, very pronounced. Like Why oh, you know, Tommy Kwan, Tommy Kwan did produce that album. I want to hear him up, you know, yes. Them album are created by People in the industry who did recognize the importance of a legacy and the importance of bringing forward some serious black consciousness in the music. We don't hear nothing like that again, product, produced again, even by the, 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 the most, the more popular artists, DJ artists, them, to come together and do albums that can increase the knowledge and understanding where African people are supposed to have. Especially now in a Jamaica, yeah, with all where we see a go on. No more than ever it is needed. Yes, because them songs do them work, you know. Yeah, man, them songs do them work already. If I mean, I it, it is still now. It did work. Will for people? More so outside of Jamaica. No of this kind of work, this work where we are pushing out. This, this compilation album. Yeah. What if people know it? Hardly anyone in Jamaica right now, even in the music industry. 
know this album here. Yeah. And we won't call it an old album. It's like, oh, you have Christmas carol. Christmas carol don't get old, you know, because every time Christmas come, and the same Christmas carol they may hear. So we feel, say, Marcus Garvey have the same position. When the time him Earth Day come, you find all the Marcus Garvey through them and play that people can hear, say, yes, they have a tribute to a great man, a great man. Marcus Mosiah Garvey, Rita Marley, them, especially them time of year. Yeah. It's a narration by Amy Ashwood Garvey. For those who over you who don't know who Amy Ashwood Garvey is, Amy Ashwood was his first wife. She was the first wife. She helped to start the UNI year. And also, she used to even direct some of the meetings. So we want to play an excerpt from one of the meetings. Like you can't have a vibes or all this. By the way, this singer is named Telma Massey. And the elder out there who know that lady, she named Telma Massey, the one who's singing. And then we're going to hear Amy Jakes Garvey. Sorry, Amy Ashwood Garvey narrating the rest of it. Ladies and gentlemen, who was Marcus Garvey? Who was this man whom Bishop Ranson of the Amy Church called the mightiest prophet of the age? Who was this man of whom the erudite James Weldon Johnson once said, he had the daring and energy of the Napoleonic personality that draws masses of followers? He stirred the imagination of the masses as no other leader ever had. In the course of time, this man, Garvey, brushed aside the Goliath of the first independent nation in the Caribbean. And he became Jamaica's first national hero. Who was Marcus Garvey? Marcus Messiah Garvey was a man, earthbent, for the eternal search of oneness with the universe. He was born at sunrise in the beautiful garden parish of St. Anne, Jamaica, West Indies on the 17th day of August, 1887, near the falls of the Roaring River, where he grew with nature and drank much of our inspiration. He was of humble birth and was the eighth child of Sarah and Marcus Mosiah Garvey Sr. Garvey was born in an atmosphere of prophecy. When his father first saw him, so close a resemblance did he bear him. He was overcome with joy. And he lifted him up in his arms and cried out, Your name shall be Messiah, and you shall someday be a Moses. There was nothing in the drab lamplit setting in which Garvey stood to speak in his native St. Anne that night in October 1914, which gave the slightest flicker of the shape of things to come. No one present not even Garvey himself believed that the stern-faced man standing so nervously before him in Jamaica would someday hold a star aloft and urge millions to gaze on it and follow him. Marcus Garvey set out on the lonely trail of smashing many of the preconceived ideas which made the black man inferior in his thinking such as to believe that he was belonging to a vicious and predestined evil race, that God and the angels were white, that he, the black man, personified the devil, who was reputedly black, that he was the likeness of black magic and misfortune, the son of Ham, a hewer of wood and drawer of water, and that all the creation of the dominant white civilization calculated to foster the concept of white supremacy was ordained by God. Garvey was an angry man. He smote his chest and demanded to know the author of the scholar's wicked forgery 4,000 years after Noah had gone to his grave in peace. When he spoke in Madison Square Garden, he served notice on all the nations squatting in Africa to get out 
before the wrath of 400 million black men, women, and children hurled them into the sea. Arising from obscurity, Garvey's never-to-be-forgotten oratory took him to the very apex of fame. Millions unquestionably followed him. Such were the conditions of his people bowed down with inferiority complex for hundreds of years that Garvey visibly touched the tears and compassion in the deliverance of his message emphatically thundered. Up, ye mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. The black man of yesterday has disappeared from the stage of human activities forever. And in his place stands a new man, erect, conscious of his manhood and right, and fully determined to preserve himself at all costs. Marcus Garvey, in his finest hour in Liberty Hall, New York, in the 1920s addressing the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, said so many things applicable to the conditions of today. To read the world's history of races written by some writers gives the impression that the black man amounted to nothing in the creation. We are satisfied, however, to know that our race gave the first great civilization to the world. For centuries, our ancestral home was the seat of learning, and here black men who were fit for the gods were philosophers, scientists, artists, and men of vision and leadership. On the other hand, our traducers were groping in darkness and continental barbarism. Black men, you are once great, and you will be great again. Great men have come out of Egypt, out of Ethiopia, out of Africa, Sahara. Great men will come out of America, the West Indies and the islands of the seas. Our history is as great as that of any race or people, and nothing on this side of heaven or hell will make us deny it, notwithstanding the false treaties, essays, speculation and philosophies. Their arrogance is but skin deep and an assumption that has no foundation in morals nor law. When we were embracing the sciences on the banks of the Nile, when our civilization had reached the noonday of progress, their ancestors were still running naked and sleeping in holes with bats, rats, and other animals. Garvey's messianic message to the groping millions of his race would surely bring him to Golgotha. His leadership would emancipate millions from the shackles of mental and moral servitude. It was the great gulf, it was the violent contrast between the upper and middle classes and the people of his race which made the first telling impact on the mind of the youthful Garvey. Illiteracy and grinding poverty were the two decisive factors which contributed to his impact. Like Socrates, Garvey geared himself for his cup of hemlock like a Christ on his way to a blood-stained cross. Before his death, however, in 1940, he would have the satisfaction of knowing that a squalid century after the emancipation of 1838, the men and systems against whom he fought such a good fight had lost forever their footing on the ladder of imperial and economic power. Marcus Garvey left you a special message, my children. Let no voice but your own speak to you from the depths. Let no voice but your own rouse you in time of peace or war. Hear all, but attend only to that which concerns you. Your allegiance shall be to your God, then to your family, race, and country. Remember always that the Jew, in his political and economic urge, is always first a Jew. The Caucasian is first a Caucasian under all circumstances. And you can do no better than to be first and always a black man. Be sure to teach your children science and religion, for it lies as our only hope to withstand the evil designs of modern materialism. Lift up your hearts and repeat to yourselves the words of the African poet Terence. I am a man. And I think that nothing that is common to humanity is foreign to me. Garvey endeared himself to his thousands of listeners when he dramatized and immortalized the heroes and heroines of Afro-American history. Through the power of his oratory, Garvey showed them that Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman 
were equally deserving of a niche in the Hall of Fame as Martha Washington and Betsy Ross. They were made to feel that the muse which inspired Phyllis Wheatley was no less fine than that of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. The black poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar was made to take his place with the great poets of the world. It was seen that the African general Hannibal surpassed Napoleon in military genius and Toussaint Louverture and Antonio Maceo were worthy of comparison with George Washington and Lord Kitchener. Marcus Garvey's spellbound audiences heard that Crispus Athos was as great as Patrick Henry and that the Ethiopian Queen of Sheba outshone Britain's Queen Victoria in the splendor of her court. Solomon, in his wisdom, towered above Gladstone. King Menelik was more than Abe Lincoln. Never before had the descendants of the slaves been so uplifted. Marcus Garvey delivered that message, and all the world wondered. Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. It was the same message delivered 4,000 years before by the Jewish patriarch. Let my people go. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of his journey, we pause to assess his work and worth. We find that Marcus Garvey has left his people in America at the crossroads of history and destiny. The now 38 independent states in Africa are the first of the fruits of them that slept in the chronology of his prophecy. To quote his own words, Hail, United States of Africa, hail. Also Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Guyana, and his own homeland, Jamaica, still on the wave of freedom. The associated states within the British Commonwealth of Nations, Grenada, Antigua, and Barbuda, Montserrat, St. Kitts, and Nevis, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Dominica, and Guilla, and the British Virgin Islands, flying the flag of freedom and independence, and echoing the voice of Marcus Garvey. Whatever his failings, Marcus Garvey brought fresh hope and courage to his people. Mankind has benefited because Marcus Garvey passed here. And who knows, but someday posterity will confirm him in the title of the Black Moses. Then millions of black men, women, and children will make the pilgrimage to his shrine in Jamaica. For they will have come to pray and kneel at the tomb of the father of African independence. Oh, he vowed to win his race's destiny, to lift them up from ignorance and hell. With deathless courage, fashioned victory, fighting on equal fairs, what if he fell? He's gone, tis true. But history yet will tell that Marcus Messiah Garvey did his work, and he did it well. Yes. Hear me. I should Garvey first wife of Marcus Mosiah Garvey narrating that yeah man I think it's the only thing you will ever hear on vinyl or CD that, that speech there so we take a break and come forward okay. yes we pay in tribute to Marcus Garvey and it's referring to the celebration that will take place this Sunday at the <clears throat> IFM Car Park. And you know, it's always a big event there. So, I want you to join me. From another day, man, in as a matter of fact, for those of you who can hear me at the 6 o'clock morning there, you can tune in to the Running African, where we will be the hosts and the hostess. Cabo and me, the host, we'll be having uh, some conversations as we usually have. And then, right through the day till 10, 11 o'clock, things will be taking place there. You know, you have everything that you want, the food, clothes, shelter, sun, <laughs> may I tell you. So, yeah, it's an it's a event, it's an event. 
that you should miss. As we say, we have a stage show that evening. We we'll leave artists. And we have things that go on with speakers inside of the great house. So, just put it by your calendar of events. And know that you will be joining and commemorating one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Pan-African leaders coming out of Jamaica. Jamaica have it put in everything. <laughs> it, whether you it bad or it good, Jamaica in everything, man, I tell you. Yes, <clears throat> so we will start with a ball for Charmian and look like them just connect to Charmian. Charmian, I tell, is a poet and a yam planter. I have to tell you, say, she had the queen of yam. Charmian, I tell what you do. Bless and love, big brother. Big <laughs> I just want some life. I want to have life. Take it from there. How do you feel? Well, I tell you, good brother, Muta. If you ever see me, I'm feeling like I work hard. That guy's a bell in hell right now. Because <laughs> <laughs> they will really give me a beat and do your boss. Hey, I don't mean that thing. I don't mean that thing. See how I get a lick. But everything is good enough because you can't man a new life, man. All you right. You have to be a cheap and grown. Yeah. Yeah, All right, so this Sunday we see say I do some poetry for the Marcus Garvey tribute. Yes, and no, so he's the one true. where I have poems and poems, pant up poems, pant up poems. Yes, so, man. Tell me exactly what you're going to do. This one there. Marcus Gavi, I never talk about you. I have one point for Marcus Gavi. I want big points still because me, the school, I'm on the women that teach, um, bright school, I'm still going to have bright spark, academic yeah. bright spark. They teach, they teach them and carry them a festival and then get one grand medal. We're the same poem. I can get one silver medal. We'll see Marcus Gavi poem wow. from JCDC. And then now we're ready to chat the poem, the same poem of Marcus Gavi. Sure. All right, Mama. And I pick up JCDC to come get one pass, uh, medal last year. From oh, yeah? Yeah, go out with it. Then why not tell right. nobody? We do a new snow poem and get big, big medal, gold medal for the snow poem. And we get gold medal, uh, one gold medal again, and we get a um, certificate. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I And we get a trophy. And yeah, we get a trophy. And 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 we get a the people have got surprised when they hear you know, I hear you at, at the Gavi thing, they must say, wait, I see that in the top of motor program. Yes. Yeah. Yam. We call you the queen of Yam, you know. Yeah, yam, yam queen. Yam, but Muta, I tell you, I do a very little end of film. Them, you know, say Yam has something where we can't survive. It's from the back and the back. Yeah, man, you know, underground, tree. man. It's underground, yeah. Yeah, I'm here fine, Yam, Vinny, I'm seeing where everything good. We never stop buying Yam, you know, because around the black tree. If yeah, you want to jump, I'm here telling me jump, jump, because Mother Earth now afraid to not, 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 not quarry to say jump, jump. And mm. every day, jump, jump, you know, brother, I'm plant, me plant every day, me reap every day, me do every day, me sell every day, me chop mm. every day, me dash every day. You know me? Uh, watch there, watch there. Mm. He's a rich woman, man, he's a rich woman. Uh, yeah, rich, but not me not no money like that, because yeah, I don't know. Money. I'm not yeah, care about I money. Re- but me rich not in the nature. All right, Mama. Yeah. So, we well, expect to see you. you. You don't know what time you're going to perform. I, I guess you're yeah, one, one, 1.30. Yeah, yeah. 1.30. Yeah, that's something I heard. That's what I heard. All right. Well, we well, look forward to see you here. Yeah, Mama. Say, now, Mr. Wanneke, please, tonight. Oh, you're going to survive. Oh, you're going to survive. You're going to survive. I think you're going to survive. I think you're going to survive. No, I'm going to survive. No, I'm going to Miss Lou, Miss Lou, Miss Lou, in Miss your kill, me na know what to say, me na know what to do. Me feel like I anything me da do. Even walk a little voodoo, 
to bring back a woman like you who was so kind and true. Yes, Miss Lou, you tried to. You helped many, many others too. You say what you say and you do what you do in an extraordinary way. You are one of a kind. The memories of you will never, never leave our mind. Truly, truly, Miss Lou, in your time, you are done just fine. You put Jamaica up on top. We Jamaicans are proud of the legacy you had inherited. Naturally, culturally, officially, with you, we have always loved to rally. Absolutely, you were no folly. You taught us a lot of things, including to respect our first language, Patwa. To dance and sing, ring sing, was a big and little thing. From in the prom, we couldn't stop green, as you and my one was a perfect combination. Entertaining, inspiring, educating, and spreading roots and culture across the nation. Miss Lou, Miss Lou, we miss you for true. Please tell Auntie Rochi, your mama, Papa, Mars, Ran, and all her ancestors, howdy. Tell them what I'm going to do. This is a hell and powder house. Mickey Mouse and him crew took over the house. The mad sick head na good. Hey, hey, yeah. But I'm such a vampire. Them a car disaster, yeah. Miss Lou, Miss Lou, I know me the love to catch your views. But never mind. As a lesson to put your mind, to soothe the mind. My words of you will always be kind. As you were a role model of mine. Truly, truly one of a kind. Miss Lou, Miss Lou, we miss you for true. Aye, aye, aye. Yeah, yeah, man, give thanks. Yes, man, give thanks. Sweet, 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 sweet tribute. Eh? Sweet, tri- sweet tribute, sweet tribute. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, man, I'm big up all the people in the red land. I Africa, you know, say me Africa, and I love the people them. Yeah. I think of, oh, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to have a week from one of them. I can't take where I'm going to have a week from one of them. I wake up and get out of the village. Don't be seen to me, you're all wrong system. All right. I wake up and Marcus Gavis say, never forget that intelligence rules the world and ignorance carries the burden. Uh, yeah. Therefore, seek as far as possible to be intelligent and stay as far as possible away from ignorance. And I could go on and on. But yeah. never mind, you have no time. Yeah, yeah, man, give thanks. Sunday, man, Sunday. 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 All right. Yeah, give thanks. Give thanks. Yeah, that is Charmian Aital. May I tell you, she fire is a man. <laughs> she fire a man. Yes. Okay. So, we're going to go forward to where we're going to do a while ago. We are telling you about this Black Bill of Rights. Why you listen to it carefully and keenly, you know? Yes, listen to it carefully and keenly. The Black Bill of Rights. The Black Bill of Rights are the aims, objects, and goals that all honest black people seek and strive for. The guideposts that we are following to freedom. The Black Bill of Rights are actually the Declaration of Rights of the Black Peoples of the World, which was drafted and adopted at a convention held in New York, 1920, over which Marcus Garvey presided as chairman, and at which time he was elected Provisional President of Africa. The people that elected Marcus Garvey provisional president of Africa came from all over the United States of America, Central and South America, the Caribbean Islands, and most sections of the African continent. These black people represented nationalists, fraternal, benevolent, civic, social, political, religious, student, and other organizations of the African ethnic groups throughout the world. They responded to a call to convention that was designed to have them take part in a positive program of the told universities of the world. The Black Bill of Rights was conceived in a more intelligent, legal, moral, 
and normal manner than was the laws of Moses, the codes of Hammurabi, the Magna Carta, the Articles of the Confederate, or the Constitution of the United States of America. And it should be respected by all sane and intelligent black people as the above codes, laws, articles, and constitution are respected by the racial and ethnic groups that conceive them. The Black Bill of Rights definitely had a broader mandate from the people it represented than did the aforementioned codes, laws, articles, or constitution. White supremacy, which is the White Bill of Rights, was not based upon the merit of the individual white man, but rather on the collective strength of the organized white world. The white race launched its call for racial unity when the non-white peoples were diversifying and organized against themselves. Around the principle which is nakedly race and white supremacy, the white race plundered the world subjugated and exploited black, brown, and yellow people for over 300 years. The primary cause of inciting this unity was the rallying cry of white supremacy. We are not arguing the moral right of the white race's conduct, nor are we extolling its feats. All we are establishing here is what the record shows. Here, the colored world numbering nearly three billion people that become an easy prey of the white race that they outnumber five to one. The margin of difference there being that they, the white men, were organized as a white man and the colored races were disorganized against themselves. The moral here is so simple that even a fool should be able to learn a lesson from it. The Black Bill of Rights is an instrument given to the black peoples of the world by the black people of the world that will allow the black race to vindicate itself and measure up to the exacting standards demanded by the new world order. It calls for racial unity and racial identity. Racial identity is the magnet fusing and welding people of the same physiognomy together for mutual advancement and the establishment of a collective high order of station for the collective group. In essence, the Black Bill of Rights was conveying that racial emancipation and advancement could not result from the merits of the individual black man, but only through the collective strength of the organized black world. Freedom is the greatest heritage of a people, and unity is its guardian. The Black Bill of Rights called for universal black unity to guide the black masses of the world to freedom. Unity is the most indispensable virtue that a race of people can possess. Racial unity reflects the margin of difference that made it possible for the white man to wipe out the Australian Bushman and the American Indian, plus two-thirds of Africa and all of South America to the sorrow of the teeming millions of barefooted, naked, and hungry people working in the stinking mines of South Africa, the grimy death holes of Lorenco Marquez, the banana patches of Central and South America, the weltering rubber plantations of Liberia, unpaid, unfed, and unclad. The Black Bill of Rights is crying out, challenging the very soul and indeed the very manhood of black men to stand up, be a man, rally to the call of racial unity as it is so amply enunciated in the 12 complaints and 54 declarations laid out by the black peoples of the world at the conventions they held in Harlem, New York, USA during the month of August 1920. The Declaration of Rights of the black peoples of the world, drafted and adopted at a convention held in New York, 1920, over which Marcus Garvey presided as chairman and at which he was elected provisional president of Africa. The preamble. Be it resolved that the black people of the world, 
through their chosen representatives in convention assembled in Liberty Hall in the city of New York and the United States of America from August 1st to August 31st, 1,920 protests against the wrongs and injustices they are suffering at the hands of their white brethren and what they deem their fair and just rights as well as the treatment they propose to demand of all men in the future. We complain one that nowhere in the world with few exceptions are black men accorded equal treatment with the white men. Although in the same situation and circumstances, but on the contrary, are discriminated against and denied the common rights due to human beings for no other reason than their race and color. We are not willingly accepted as guests in the public hotels and inns of the world for no other reason than our race and color. Two. In certain parts of the United States of America, our race is denied the right of public trial accorded to other races when accused of crime, but are lynched and burned by mobs. And such brutal and inhuman treatment is even practiced upon our women. Three. That European nations have parceled out among them and taken possession of nearly all of the continent of Africa. And the natives are compelled to surrender their lands to aliens and are treated in, in most instances like slaves. Four. In the southern portion of the United States of America, all those citizens under the federal constitution and in some states almost equal to the whites in population and our qualified landowners and taxpayers, we are nevertheless denied all voice in the making and administration of the laws and are taxed without representation by the state governments and at the same time compelled to do military service in defense of the country. Five. On the public conveyances and common carriers in the southern portion of the United States, we are Jim Crow and compelled to accept separate and inferior accommodations and made to pay the same fare charge for first-class accommodations. And our families are often humiliated and insulted by drunken white men who habitually pass through the Jim Crow cars going to the smoking car. Six. The physicians of our race are denied the right to attend their patients while in the public hospitals of the cities and states where they reside in certain parts of the United States. Our children are forced to attend inferior separate schools for shorter terms than white children. And the public school funds are unequally divided between the white and black schools. Seven. We are discriminated against and denied an equal chance to earn wages for the support of our families and in many instances are refused into labor unions and nearly everywhere are paid smaller wages than white men eight in civil service and departmental offices we are everywhere discriminated against and made to feel that to be a black man in europe america and the west indies is equivalent to being an outcast and a leper among the races of men, no matter what the character and attainments of the black men may be. Nine. In the British and other West Indian islands and colonies, black people are secretly and cunningly discriminated against 
and denied those fuller rights of governments to which white citizens are appointed, nominated, and elected. Ten. That our people in those parts are forced to work for lower wages than the average standard of white men and are kept in conditions repugnant to good civilized tastes and customs. Eleven. That the many acts of injustices against the members of our race before the courts of law in the respective islands and colonies are of such nature as to create disgust and disrespect for the white man's sense of justice. Twelve. Against all such inhuman and uncivilized treatment, we here and now emphatically protest and invoke the condemnation of all mankind. In order to encourage our race all over the world and to stimulate it to a higher and grander destiny, we demand and insist on the following Declaration of Rights. Yes, that is part one. You know, it's, it's, it's really ironical and strange you now that him say that black people, I mean, I want to tell you too, it's up to now the 60s. I know the 60s, them stopped that foolishness there. Where black people and white people use two different toilets. Them have white over the thing and non-white. Over the other, over the other, um, toilet. Yet still, two things we are talking about now. Yet still, black people was allowed to join the army to fight for America. Black people was allowed in the army to fight for America. And then, we see something of the Buffalo soldiers which was black people. They was fighting for America, freedom from the British, and them help to kill off the Native Americans. Yet still they was treated and lynched. They was lynched, continuously being lynched, and never allowed in certain toilet, and also never allowed the same rights, because they were seen as Four feet of a human being. Can you believe that? You better believe it. Now we say, male, I use female bathroom and female, I use male bathroom. That is where they know. One, be it known to all men that whereas all men are created, equal and entitled to the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And because of this, we, the duly elected representatives of the black peoples of the world, do declare all men, women, and children of our blood throughout the world free citizens, and do claim them as free citizens of Africa, the motherland of all black people. Two. That we believe in the supreme authority of our race in all things racial. That all things are created and given to man as a common possession. That there should be an equitable distribution and apportionment of all such things. And in the consideration of the fact that as a race we are now deprived of those things that are morally and legally ours, that we believe the black race, like any other race, should be governed by the ethics of civilization and therefore should not be deprived of any of those rights or privileges common to all human beings. For we declare that black people wheresoever they form a community among themselves, should be given the right to elect their own representatives, to represent them in legislatures, courts of law, or such institutions as may exercise control over that particular community. Five. We assert that the black man is entitled 
to even-handed justice before all courts of law and equity in whatever country he may be found. And when count of his race or color, such denial is an insult to the race as a whole and should be resented by the entire body of black people. Six. We declare it unfair and prejudicial to the rights of black people in communities where they exist in considerable numbers to be tried by a judge and jury composed entirely of an alien race. But in all such cases, members of our race are entitled to representation on the jury. Seven. We believe that any law or practice that tends to deprive any African of his land or the privileges of free citizenship within his country is unjust and immoral and no native should respect any such law or practice. Eight. We declare taxation without representation unjust and tyrannous and there should be no obligation on the part of the black man to obey the levy of a tax by any law-making body from which he is excluded and denied representation on account of his race and color. Nine. We believe that any law especially directed against the black man to his detriment and singling him out because of his race or color is unfair and immoral and should not be respected. Ten. We believe all men entitled to common human respect and that our race should in no way tolerate any insults that may be interpreted to mean disrespect to our color. Eleven. We denounce the use of the terms nigger, nigra, or negro when applied to black people and demand that we be called black or Africans. Twelve. We believe that the black man should adopt every means to protect himself against barbarous practices inflicted upon him because of his color. All right, we'll take a break here because you know, it's 12 o'clock time, but I want you to listen to it, you know. Listen, because this is the things with them. From 1920, them things are set out, you know. You know, some of them care, them, 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 them can't lynch you like how them used to lynch you. Them, them are not tie it again. We separate you. So it's a whole heap of things change. But there's so much things that never change. So much things that never change. So we're going to take the 12 o'clock break and come forward. It's now midnight in Jamaica. Midnight well, is there with you. So we're going to continue the Black Bill of Rights. Here we go. 13. We believe in the freedom of Africa for the black people of the world. And by the principle of Europe for the Europeans and Asia for the Asiatics, we also demand Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. 14. We believe in the inherent right of the black man to possess himself of Africa and that his possession of same shall not be regarded as an infringement on any claim or purchase made by any race or nation. 15. We strongly condemn the cupidity of those nations of the world who by open aggression or secret schemes have seized the territories and inexhaustible natural wealth of Africa. And we place on record our most solemn determination to reclaim the treasures and possessions of the vast continent of our forefathers. Sixteen. We believe... All men should live in peace, one with the other. But when races and nations provoke the ire of other races and nations by attempting to infringe upon their rights, war becomes inevitable. And the attempt in any way to free oneself or protect one's right or heritage 
becomes justifiable. 17. Whereas the lynching by burning, hanging or any other means of human beings is a barbarous practice and a shame and a disgrace to civilization. We therefore declare any country guilty of such atrocities outside the pale of civilization. 18. We protest against the atrocious crime of whipping, flogging, and overworking of the native tribes of Africa. These are methods that should be abolished and all means should be taken to prevent a continuance of such brutal practices. 19. We protest against the atrocious practice of shaving the heads of Africans, especially of African women or individuals of African blood, when placed in prison as a punishment for crime by an alien race. 20. We protest against segregated districts, separate public conveyances, industrial discrimination, lynchings, and limitations of political privileges of any black citizen in any part of the world on account of race, color, or creed, and will exert our full influence and power against all such. 21. We protest against any punishment inflicted upon a black man with severity as against lighter punishment inflicted upon another of an alien race for like offense as an act of prejudice and injustice and should be resented by the entire race. 22. We protest against the system of education in any country where black people are denied the same privileges and advantages as other races. 23. We declare it inhuman and unfair to boycott black people from industries and labor in any part of the world. 24. We believe in the doctrine of the freedom of the press. And we therefore emphatically protest against the suppression of black newspapers and periodicals in various parts of the world. And call upon black people everywhere to employ all available means to prevent such suppression. 25. We further demand free speech universally for all men. 26. We hereby protest against the publication of scandalous and inflammatory articles by an alien press tending to create racial strife and the exhibition of picture films showing the black man as a cannibal. 27. We believe in the self-determination of all peoples. 29. We declare ourselves the sworn protectors of the honor and virtue of our women and children and pledge our lives for their protection and defense everywhere and under all circumstances from wrongs and outrages. 30. We demand the right of unlimited and unprejudiced education for ourselves and our posterity forever. 31. We declare that the teaching in any school by alien teachers to our boys and girls that the alien race is superior to the black race is an insult to the black people of the world. 32. Where black people form a part of the citizenry of any country and pass the civil service examination of such country, we declared them entitled to the same consideration as any other citizens as to appointments in such civil service. 33. We vigorously protest against the increasingly unfair and unjust treatment accorded black travelers on land and sea by the agents and employees of railroad and steamship companies and insist that for equal fare we receive equal privileges with travelers of other races. 34. We declare it unjust 
for any country, state or nation, to enact laws tending to hinder and obstruct the free immigration of black people on account of their race and color. 35. That the right of the black man to travel unmolested throughout the world be not abridged by any person or persons. And all black people are called upon to give aid to a fellow black man when thus molested. 36. We declare that all black people are entitled to the same right to travel over the world as other men. 37. We hereby demand that the governments of the world recognize our leader and his representatives chosen by the race to look after the welfare of our people under such governments. 38. We demand complete control of our social institutions without interference by any alien race or races. 39. That the colors red, black, and green be the colors of the black race. 41. We believe that any limited liberty which deprives one of the complete rights and prerogatives of full citizenship is but a modified form of slavery. 42. We declare it an injustice to our people and a serious impediment to the health of the race to deny competent licensed black physicians the right to practice in the public hospitals of the communities in which they reside for no other reason than their race and color. 43. We call upon the various governments of the world to accept and acknowledge black representatives who shall be sent to the said government to represent the general welfare of the black peoples of the world. 44. We deplore and protest against the practice of confining juvenile prisoners in prisons with adults and we recommend that such youthful prisoners be taught gainful trades under humane supervision 45 be it further resolved that we as a race of people declare the league of nations null and void as far as the black man is concerned in that it seeks to deprive black people of their liberty. 47. We declare that no black man shall engage himself in battle for an alien race without first obtaining the consent of the leader of the black people of the world, except in a matter of national self-defense. 48. We protest against the practice of drafting black men and sending them to war with alien forces without proper training and demand in all cases that black soldiers be given the same training as the aliens. 49. We demand that instructions given black children in school include the subject of black history to their benefit. 50. We demand a free and unfettered commercial intercourse with all the black people of the world. 51. We declare for the absolute freedom of the seas for all people. 52. We demand that our accredited representatives be given proper recognition in all leagues, conferences, conventions, or courts of international arbitration. Wherever human rights are discussed. 53. We proclaim the 31st day of August of each year to be an international holiday to be observed by all black people. 54. We want all men to know. We shall maintain and contend for the freedom and equality of every man woman and child of our race with our lives our fortunes and our sacred honor these rights we believe to be justly ours and proper for the protection of the black race at large 
And because of this belief, we on behalf of the 400 million black people of the world do pledge herein the sacred blood of the race in defense. And we hereby subscribe our names as a guarantee of the truthfulness and faithfulness. On the 13th day of August, 1920. Past 12 o'clock, midnight. The time on IWFM is. Yeah, as we say, it's 15 minutes past 12 in Jamaica. Parents gearing up for back to school expenses? Well, Chris and Charles is making back to school as easy as ABC. From July 1st to August 23rd, 2024. Borrow at low rates, and here it is. You can win one of 24 back to school grants of $50,000. Imagine the possibilities covering all your expenses and winning big. Call us at 876-926-0609 or visit our website for details. When you think loans, think Chris and Charles. Exquisite food, great music. Come to Retro Brunch. August 18 at Comida Crave HQ, 10 Fort Augusta Drive in Port Moore, St. Catherine from 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. Music by Welton Irie, CJ Rush, and Master Raj. Admission free with an all-you-can-eat brunch option for only $5,000. Curbside pickup also available. That's Retro Brunch. August 18 at Comida Crave HQ, 10 Fort Augusta Drive, also known as Back Road in Port Moore, St. Catherine, 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. Exquisite food, great music. Dragon Stout present Streets Festival Saturday, August the 24th Stadium, Car Park And that's where the apparition will take place Music by your studio, the billboard selector World Book, DJ Liquid Copper Shot, live performance from Granite Law How on the FML? Must be 18 years or older to drink Drink and live responsibly <laughs> While driving through Jamaica, there's only one radio station I listen to. 53rd anniversary in August 1973. 53 years ago, the black people of the world took inventory of their economic, social, and political status. And they found the black masses at the bottom rung and political ladder in every country in which they preside. The land of their... 53 years ago... The black people of the world paused and took serious note of the rapid current of world events as it reflects itself upon people of the African ethnic group. They realized that there was a crying need and demand by the people of the African ethnic group for a clear-cut, concise, and positive program of action. If the tragic and miserable condition that they have endured for lo these many centuries are to be corrected and the people of the black race be led along the pathway of progress and advancement. The Black Bill of Rights demanded that the black people of the world read the handwriting on the wall and realize that the collective strength of the organized black world was the basic requirement for racial advancement and survival. The Black Bill of Rights made the black masses of the world realize that their problem was a lack of status, and world status shall only be theirs when they resell themselves on the continent of Africa, the land of their ancestors. When they build their own, a government, a racial empire, a hegemony capable of defending and protecting the aristocracy of the black people of the world wherever they may reside. The Black Bill of Rights demand that from Cape to Cairo, from Conakry to Bendarbella, from Lagos to the mountains of the moon, that the tricolor of the red, black, and green flutter in the breeze, symbolizing the strength of a black nation on the ready with comeback gear, a black army, navy, and air force, always tense, anxious, and ready to prove the right of the black people to live on this earth and to be respected by all other peoples of the world, to have the black women treated as ladies and the black children accorded the condescension that children are entitled to. 
the Black Bill of Rights submit that the above conditions could be created by the productive ingenuity of the black man's determination to exert himself on the basis of race, not integration or religion, but on the basis of the black man's infatuation with the grandeur of his person, the excellence of his race, and the vitality of his species to equal, if not excel, all others. The Black Bill of Rights called upon, nay, challenged the manhood of the black race to rally and make the conditions we have just described become a reality. The Black Bill of Rights not only gave the black masses of the world a philosophical solution, but it also gave them a material and realistic solution. It is a program, if followed right, that will make the black masses of the world materially better off. They will eat more and better food, wear more and better clothes, live in more and better houses, and be protected by more and better armies, navies, and air forces. The Black Bill of Rights pointed out that the primary problem as it projects itself upon the black people in the United States of America in particular and the black people of the world in general is economic and be treated as such. As far as our knowledge of man's endeavor, his history and civilization has revealed the crux of mankind's troubles and can be summed up by the respective group's ability or inability to solve the mysteries of their economic problem. History has shown that once a people focus their attention on their economic plight and organize it, all else normally take care of itself. With the establishment of a sovereign economy by the group comes self-reliance, racial clannishness, mass cooperation, and a common cause psychosis which invariably leads to the erection of racial standards and the formulation of a distinct and exclusive sense of value, evolving into an, an original racial cultural pattern, reaching its climax in a deafening mass clamor for nationhood. The Black Bill of Rights will observe its 53rd anniversary far from being materialized in the United States of America in particular, and in the world in general. Because of the fact that the black people are being used as a tool by a gang of Machiavellian schemers operating from the North, United States of America, led by white people with a regular retinue of house niggers fronting as leaders. These scoundrels have no program to offer the masses of black people, but holds up before the myopic focus of frustrated Negroes, the degenerate mirage of miscegenation, social equality, and integration with white people. Nor can it be said in their favor that they have ever shown any measure of sincerity in attempting to improve the condition affecting the masses. Actually, the members of this clique have very little affinity with the black race. Ideologically, this band of parasites have a bastard complex, which they dramatize whenever the opportunity presents itself. They marry white women, or second best, move into lily white neighborhoods, far, far away from the black masses they claim to love so well. On the other hand, we have the white people, who for many centuries have been unduly impressed with their own importance to such an extent that they actually believe they have a divine mandate to regulate the affairs of all men. And in this connection, we see them teaching black Negroes to see God in a white man's image. They further prefer to the naive Negro, the white woman as the symbol of feminine beauty and naturally they claim a monopoly on all the intelligence in this world. Right or wrong is based on their interpretation to suit their convenience. It is noble and right for them to be patriotic to their cause, race, and country. But when the black man feels the same sentiment, he is wrong and a dangerous troublemaker who must be jailed. The Black Bill of Rights has inspired black people to have 
follow up universal conventions, conferences, and other meetings calling for unification of the black race universally. The 1920 convention was promoted through the efforts of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the largest organization of the black race, for the black race, and by the black race in modern times. Several latter conventions were sponsored by the UNIA until Garvey's death in 1940. All these conventions were called to implement the program of the Black Bill of Rights. The Black Bill of Rights called for the black masses of the world to embrace a program of orthodox African nationalism if they are to survive. Many black organizations have promoted conferences and conventions for the same or similar purposes as the UNIA to make the goal of the Black Bill of Rights a reality. Most notably among the follow-up black organizations who made efforts to make the Black Bill of Rights a reality was the African Nationalist Pioneer Movement, which was founded and led by the late Honorable Carlos A. Cooks from 1941 to 1966. In 1959, the African Nationalist Pioneer Movement, under the determined leadership of Carlos A. Cooks, sponsored a call to convention to further implement the Black Bill of Rights. A form of tokenism was given the blacks in the United States, Central and South America, the Caribbean Islands, and some sections of Africa in response to the Black Bill of Rights of 1920. This tokenism was limited mainly to the 12 complaints of the Black Bill of Rights. However, the 54 declarations have been emphatically ignored almost in total. In rejecting the Black Bill of Rights as a complete instrument, the black masses of the world was denying itself freedom. The black masses focused their attention on the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments of the Constitutions of the United States of America instead of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Declarations of the Black Bill of Rights. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments of the United States of American Constitution gave the black people in the United States of America a theoretical citizenship in the United States. However, the record shows that over 100 years later, the black masses remain an economic liability, a social leper, and a political non-entity in the United States, and his human rights are still in doubt. The 13th, 14th, and 15th declarations of the Black Bill of Rights are as follows. 13. We believe in the freedom of Africa for the African peoples of the world and by the principle of Europe for the Europeans and Asia for the Asiatics, we also demand Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. 14. We believe in the inherent right of the black man to possess himself of Africa and that his possession of same shall not be regarded as an infringement on any claim or purchase made by any race or nation. 15. We strongly condemn the cupidity of those nations of the world who, by open aggression or secret schemes, have seized the territories and inexhaustible natural wealth of Africa. And we place on record our most solemn determination to reclaim the treasures and possessions of the vast continent of our forefathers. These declarations demand the black masses to acknowledge their ancestral homeland and repossess it by whatsoever means possible, without apology to anyone. The 15th declaration ends with, and we place on record our most solemn determination to reclaim the treasures and possession, the inexhaustible natural wealth of Africa and then of our forefathers. The Black Bill of Rights 13th, 14th, and 15th Declaration offer the black masses a more dignified and human program than the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments of the United States of America's Constitution. 
the Black Bill of Rights had to counteract with the plans of the exploiters of the race. And we will suffice to say that the enemies of black opportunity worn out. The conditions that resulted can be best summed up in a poem written by the late Honorable Carlos A. Cooks entitled, Strange Isn't It? Which goes as follows. Strange isn't it that every race on earth can see beauty in their own women except you know who. That all women, whether they be Malay, Chinese, Caucasian, or Hindu, accept their hair and color as a natural gift. Except, can you guess who? That everybody, from the Arab to the Chinese, believe in their own God and see God in the image and likeness of their race. That's right. But with them, God looks like somebody else. And why is it that they are always taking the white man to court to legally compel whites to accept them as a neighbor? Could it be that they are still suffering from an inferiority complex? And long, sharp, mobile knives to butcher each other with. Is it because they hate themselves? And doesn't it seem funny that all other people concentrate on operating banks, railroads, textile mills, steamship lines, airlines, trucking lines, and packing houses, etc. But they concentrate on operating churches. And why do they buy so many expensive cars and live in such dingy little coops? Wouldn't it be better if they would invest the money spent on cars in homes and businesses? No. That would be too much a display of intelligence. And why are they always begging for jobs, good jobs, more jobs, and never bother to create businesses that make such jobs possible? Because they are flunkies at heart. And why do they keep griping and shouting about prejudice and Jim Crow? Everybody knows that they are the greatest enemies of their own opportunity. They have refused to buy black. And how is it that New York is supposed to be so cosmopolitan? But we don't see them operating business in other communities. Nevertheless, all species of man can be found in their community operating and controlling the business and naturally carting the money out of the community. A fool and his money must part. They must have an awful queer taste for entertainment. To sit down in a movie and see a white man and a white woman enact a fantastic plot that invariably connote the essence of white supremacy. They actually laugh or applaud when their race is held up to ridicule. Are they really human? And how could they reject a doctrine such as Garveyism with all its appeal to reason, antidotes for their miserable plight, and inspiration to racial pride majesty and manhood, holding out to them the pomp and dignity of nationhood, war, respect, and... Yes, we want to take a break and come forward. Break time. Through the instrumentality of black nationalism, Africa could be free today. Think of it. A powerful martial black government in Africa, controlled from Cape to Cairo by nationalist black militarists, with African ships sailing the seven seas, building a universal commercial empire, with African generals and ministers as watchdogs of that empire, with black armies and navies to defend the empire. Ah, but the poor devils had a porter's mentality, and they scorned the doctrine of real freedom, Garveyism, for the bastard doctrine of miscegenation, and the perverted Bolshevik communist promise of social equality. The All-African People's Convention held in New York City, August 1959, was sponsored by the African Nationalist Pioneer Movement under Carlos A. Cooks. The call was addressed to all nationalists, fraternal, civic, social, and religious organizations of the African ethnic group throughout the world. 
The agenda was as follows. One, the complete abrogation of that ominous appellation, Negro, a term closely connected with nigger. It's derogatory, vulgar, and offensive. It neither defines man, land of origin, or heritage. Therefore, we submit that the members of the African racial group shall henceforth be addressed with the same dignity and respect extended to all other races and nationality groups. We demand to be called, when dealing with color, black men and women, and when dealing with race, land, and heritage, Africans. Two, the total mobilization of all the material resources of the black race in all areas of the world, binding them together into one grand racial hegemony, whose only purpose shall be the welfare and security of black people everywhere. Three, the activations of the African community leagues in all communities where people of the African ethnic group are in the majority. The economy of all African communities must be marshaled, controlled, and challenged in a progressive direction so that the commerce, business life, and body politic of the community be controlled totally by the resident majority. Four, the synchronization of all organizations, regardless of religious passion or sectional sentiment, to one overall aim and endeavor towards the complete freedom of Africa for the benefit of the African peoples of the world. This should include moral, physical, and material support to the needy cause of the valiant Africans at home who are fighting against tremendous odds. This convention was a follow-up convention on the Black Bill of Rights, and its impact have had far-reaching consequences in that racial identity is pretty well accepted by the black masses of today. However, the implementation of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Declaration of the 1920 Black Bill of Rights, which was incarnated in the second, third, and fourth points of the agenda of the 1959 Convention, remains mainly in a philosophical state. A uh, bridging called Don Carlos, singing over a Basilian tune, Declaration of Rights. You know, you have so much version of that tune. You have a Griffiths. Sing it. Don Carlos was the original, one of the original singer them in the Black Euro group. Him still all over the place at tour as a solo artist. Dan Carlos. Yes. So we are continuing the journey, as we say, with the Marcos Garvey vibes. You know, if nobody is not do it, we are going to do it. And that is spend a whole program. I deal with Marcos Garvey. Yes. Whole program. We we'll continue the journey. The same profound. I have no instrument. <laughs> Him just use him body. So everything where I hear there is him. Everything where I hear. No instrument, just him body. Serious, serious artist them there. Ah, <clears throat> you know, years ago, we are going to show up to see that brother here perform and this is so impressive that I go after the show I have him for the CD. You know, much time I go back to England and I hope so I see him. But I'm about a new CD. I will not see what I again, again, again. So I uh, hear up anybody who know him. Tell him, say, Muta Baruka. Would I love get an CD from him? Cause another, I must, another one CD, man. I'm sure of that. And I'm gonna perform all the while, all over Europe. I tell you, Slavery Days, original Burning Sphere tune. Hey. A while ago, we played the Bill of Rights speech there. And you hear the man say that conference was in 1920. 
No, who want play a speech by Marcus Gave? I think he's in a Madison Square Garden and give a speech at all. In a 1921. This are not, this are not the copy vice that we hear about the place. This are Marcus Gave, original vice. Inform you that the Universal Negro Movement Association is an organization that seeks to unite into one solid body the 400 million Negroes of the world. The link of the 15 million Negroes of the United States of America with the 20 million Negroes of the West Indies, the 40 million Negroes of South and Central America, with the 280 million Negroes of Africa, for the purpose of bettering our industrial, commercial, educational, social, and political conditions. There are 400 million Africans in the world who have Negro blood coursing through their veins. And we believe that the time has come to unite these 400 million people for the one common purpose of bettering their conditions. But within the last four years, the Universal Negro Movement Association has worked wonders in bringing together in one fold four million organized Negroes who are scattered in all parts of the world. These in the 48 states of the American Union, all the West Indian Islands, and the countries of South and Central America and Africa. These four million people are working to convert the rest of the 400 million scattered all over the world. And it is for this purpose that we are asking you to join our ranks and to do the best you can to help us to bring about an emancipated race. If anything praiseworthy is to be done, it must be done through unity. And it is for that reason that the Universal Negro Movement Association calls upon every Negro in the United States to rally to its standards. We want to unite the Negro race in this country. We want every Negro to work for one common object, that of building a nation of his own on the great continent of Africa. But all Negroes all over the world are working for the establishment of a government in Africa means that it will be realized in another few years. We want the moral and financial support of every Negro to make the dream a possibility. Already, this organization has established itself in Liberia, West Africa, and is endeavoring to do all possible to develop that Negro country to become a great industrial and commercial commonwealth. Pioneers have been sent by this organization to Liberia. And we are now laying the foundations upon which the 400 million Negroes of the world will build. If you believe that the Negro has a soul, if you believe that the Negro is a man, if you believe that the Negro was endowed with the senses commonly given to other men by the Creator, then you must acknowledge that what other men have done, Negroes can do. We want to build up cities, nations, governments, industries of our own in Africa, so that we'll be able to have a chance to rise from the lowest to the highest positions in the African Commonwealth. That was Marcus Gavi, original vice. Hello. 1921 in New York. As I say, I think it's Madison Square Garden. Him do that speech there. Marcus Gavi, original vice. Yes, one Marcus Gavi. We will play the next tune yeah, because this man here. Yeah, have Jamaican blood in him, and may I tell you, say, Jamaican blood, I don't know, he's a Jamaican blood. <laughs> Can we say, come on out there, with our Jamaican blood. We say, Arabella Fante with him Jamaican blood. Colin Powell, you remember him? We tell the people about weapon of mass destruction in Iraq. Jamaican blood. And if you go down the line, you'll have frightened to say how much people have that. Either them father come from Jamaica or them mother come from Jamaica. That means that them are African. Yes. Even if them don't know it, them are African. So, who want to play Louis Farrakhan? Louis Farrakhan have Jamaican blood in him. That means that he's African. Yes, we there with you upon the cutting edge. I got you the Marcus Gavi from 10 o'clock. We are pay tribute from 10 o'clock. Yeah, man, that's how we do it when we are pay tribute. We don't do five minutes and two minutes thing. We go straight, you understand? So, we will continue musically. And <clears throat> this is a group where most ones know them from them time there. And then make some 
wonderful music. Yes. Still the boat too. I make music. Still the boat. So here we go now. We are going to play this tune here by the same group where we are talking about. This is Mabrak. That means lightning. Mm-hmm. 